Well, I have a question for Mike. Um, because I just got the ketonics. There is any difference to put it in the standard or the sport or the nutritional level in when we do the calibration? You can set the ranges of feedback as you want. Uh, it's more preference of color. The, the standard comes with the standard settings, which is good feedback for beginning ketosis. And the sport is more spread out scale. So if you don't have a computer and can't change the settings, you can either buy the red or the blue one. They come pre-configured with these two settings. So it's more a preference of color, actually. For Michelle and uh, Allison, I had a question about the timing of when you use the breathalyzer. Is it right after you eat, middle of the day, when you get up in the morning, and how does that correlate? Because as a family physician, if I'm going to use this, I've got to kind of give my patients an idea of how to use, how to use it and when. Did you say it together? <laughs> All the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I use it before breakfast, uh, even sometimes in the middle of the breakfast, because I got a large cup of coffee and it takes a while to digest it. Uh, I do it after meals, before training, after training, during training. I do it all the time to see how my body works. It's different for everybody. So, and it, it differs during the day, and depending on what you do. And, and that is the most interesting part to create a ketogenic lifestyle that you figure out what works for you. That is how I use it. And Michelle was telling me a funny story about um, a lot of people talk about whether you can drink alcohol or not. And as we know, you know, it's totally dependent on the person's metabolism. He was saying he was doing an N equals one experiment on drinking wine. And he'd drink wine, blow into the meter, drink a little more wine, blow into the meter, drink a little more wine. And you know, so everybody's metabolism is different. And I thought that was really fun to play around with foods. And he was noticing how long it took two glasses of wine and you were OK for you personally, but three threw, threw you out. I can tell you the, the story is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I have one glass of wine to my dinner, am I in ketosis the day after? Yes. So, hmm, I can try this. I had two glasses of wine. Yes, I was still in ketosis. Three glasses of wine, no. <laughs> so going driving the next day is not good anyway. <laughs> okay, but definitely not if you have epilepsy and want a high level of ketosis. And I also did this when I was flying to the States, 13 hours to, to San Francisco. I had a USB port in front of me. So I did this uh, study. And it, took, it takes three hours for a little glass of red wine for my body to metabolize. And the interesting part is that the ketosis didn't disappear. It just continued afterward, after three hours. So you can do interesting experiments like the coconut oil for Alison. That didn't work for her. It does for me. And like a couple of sips of wine for me, and I'm out. So good to know, you know? Eric Westman, Durham, North Carolina. This is an exercise and general health question. Therapeutically, the ketogenic diet can do wonderful things. It's amazing, diabetes, high blood pressure, all that. We've done medical studies on all that. But I get questions, especially from youngsters, who there's a saying that you, know, you can get away with things when you're young, but not when you're older. Is it a genetic, uh, um, so should everyone be on a ketogenic diet? And are there benefits um, for having carbs when you're young or if you have insulin sensitivity? So the classic two by two table is low carb works for even whether you're insulin sensitive or insulin resistance. Low fat works if you're insulin sensitive, but not insulin resistant. If you only had one cho choice, I would choose low carb because it works for everyone. Yeah. So, but then it, when people are young and, and able to burn off things, well now I add in exercise and age and so should everyone be on a ketogenic diet? And I'm, I'm not quite to that level of being convinced, but I, I wonder if you just 
Take it one at a time, please. Okay. Um, well, that's always a what if, uh, kind of because everybody's different. So there's and there's a lot of variables involved. So, but I think that it's it's. I think the important thing, the most salient thing, is is from a young age, the better you can retain your fat adaptation, the better you're going to retain your insulin sensitivity and carbohydrate tolerance. And some people are not very carbohydrate tolerant, and some people are very carbohydrate tolerant. But even the very carbohydrate tolerant people should be trying to maintain their their um, ability to metabolize fat, and, and that's the power of the combination of fat adaptation with exercise. And like basically everything I have seen in the literature, the textbooks, and then working with athletes, um, if you're fueling any volume of exercise with glucose, it's not a question of, of if, but when and in what form you're going to have a problem. And I don't see that. And, and I'm a, since I'm not an MD or a PhD, I don't, <laughs> I, my reputation is what it is. I, don't, I can say these things. So, but if you're, if you're doing it that um, doing the exercise combined with a fat burning base, um, carbohydrates can be tolerated, but also it's creating this new, as I said, this new um, metabolic model of human fitness that's just not out there in the textbooks and the, and the, you know, the medical literature at this point. I think uh, the people here who do work with athletes who are fat adapted realize this. It's just we have to develop the model. I think, yeah, in some way, I think that everyone should be, I mean, everyone should be fat adapted. So it, whether it's ketosis or just lower carb or paleo kind of approach, mainly because of injury prevention. So younger people more so if they're higher volume with my CrossFitters, I train a lot of younger athletes. And that's the biggest thing they see is that they're recovering. Like um, your presentation, it's not just that instant recovery right after. It's they're not going to be as sore. They're not going to, you know, all the fat is actually working to make their body less inflamed. Um, just making sure that... One thing I see in my practice as a nutritional therapist is that depending on their diet before, sometimes it takes a lo longer time to adjust them to that because they are not responding well and they say, I'm, I'm out, I'm not responding well, this isn't it. Sometimes they're just not giving it enough time and sometimes they are so low fat or non-fat or bad fat that they, their gallbladder is not doing what it needs to do and so it's a kind of a shock to the system. And so I've, I've just been really careful with just jumping people right into it and just slowly easing them into it. And from that standpoint, every person, no matter their age in my practice, has been really great at being fat adapted. My doctors, um, she's got about 7,000 patients and for the last, I don't know, 20 years, she's been restricting them to around 25 grams of sugar a day and she was certain brain, certain cancers like brain and pancreatic are more sugar hungry. So they were going, in, like myself, into ketosis. And the other cancer patients were just limited on the 25 grams. She was seeing such difference in the blood pro profiles as far as inflammation numbers, CRP, LDH, um, VEGF. And this is quality also, not just quantity of ketosis, you know, really going for grass fed, grass finished organic vegetables, high amounts of vegetables, nine cups of vegetables a day, one and a half cups of fat, and the sprinkling of protein. She was seeing such great results with us in ketosis as in, versus her other patients that she's now moving all the patients into a ketogenic state. And the interesting thing is, personally, I had, unbeknownst to me, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, I also had fibroids in my breasts, and I had Hashimoto's. I found this out after I was diagnosed with brain cancer. All of those did not go away on the 25 grams of sugar per day. But once I got to the five grams of sugar a day and the cup and a half of fat, which was, you know, as you know, getting to a cup and a half, my fibroids disappeared, my polycystic ovarian disappeared, and my Hashimoto's disappeared in three months. That was absolutely mind-blowing to me. Yeah, oh, Eric, um, I think one of the things you might, that uh, can be useful is if you look at the original uh, carb loading studies out of Sweden, at the time they were done, um, it was before the whole uh, lo low fat, high carb dogma came out and they were using young competitive male athletes so they weren't broken. 
and they were putting them through some level of carbohydrate restriction before they loaded them up. And that's and what people don't realize is, is if you can stay fit, and, re, and so I think the message there is to retain that fat adaptation as much as possible because we really are a lot more robust until we aren't. And, and <laughs> you know, we don't, people who get metabolically wrecked, didn't, it didn't happen overnight. So by retaining that fat adaptation, um, that occasional hit of carbohydrate for that extra bang uh, isn't going to be a problem. And in fact, I'm tending to frame with my athletes with our strategic carb protocol is we are starting to look at concentrated forms of carbohydrates as a legal PED and using them that way because they work very much like a, a performance enhancing drug. Okay. Thank you. Um, look, I think the, the high fat message is fabulous and we need to get it out there. But I think just as a word of caution to the panel and to everybody, we have to be a bit careful. I mean, as a gastroenterologist, I'd see up to five new cases of bowel cancer a week doing colonoscopy. And we're seeing lots of pictures of nicely burnt bacon and burnt steaks and so forth. And although there's not a strong correlation between fat and bowel cancer, there is a strong correlation between processed meats like bacon, barbecuing your meat, cooking your steak like that. And if you're pushing these diets and we're trying to get them out there in the media and getting people to take them and you're encouraging lots of people to eat this stuff, saying bacon's wonderful and so on, and that's great, Emily. I don't have a problem with that too much. But I think you've got to be careful. Some of these foods are potentially carcinogenic. Saturated fat mightn't be, but bowel cancer is the commonest cause of cancer-related death in non-smoking males, you know, in their 40s, 50s and 60s, and the second commonest in Western society in non-smoking females. And um, I think you've got to be careful about healthy fats. If you burn fats, if you process fats, you shouldn't be forcing them down people's throats. So I think you should. You can't live on olive oil. Sure, but you can, and you can certainly have lots of animal fat, but I think you've got to be very careful in getting the message across about how you're selling that to the population. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think one thing I do say is that was one of my, bacon and skinny jeans got a lot of like, oh, I could have any kind of bacon, and I was seeing pictures on my social media of really terrible bacon. Um, and so fi I only have one source that I love. It's from Pete's Paleo, and they, I know that where the, those pig, what they've been going through and what they're being fed, and I think that's a big piece of the case studies of, um, correlation between bacon and cancer is where are these sources coming from and then knowing you know for most of my fats it's a mix of saturated monounsaturated polyunsaturated and knowing it's not just one type it's a like good medley uh, about 50% for me is what works really well so I, I do do a good job of explaining that and hopefully I didn't you know upset anybody about the bacon. I, I agree because I raise pigs and I'm the only one I know that doesn't use like GMO corn to raise their pigs. So the only bacon that I can eat is the bacon that I've made myself because all bacon is cured with sugar. So the grams of sugar are too high on most bacons, but if you're, if you're going to have 90% of your diet, in my case, come from fat, those fats, you better know where they came from. And those animals had to have eaten the most pure, great diet that you can find. And if you're having nitrates and barbecue and bad GMO corn in that bacon, you can make your situation worse and your VEGF and your inflammation factors, you'll actually see them in your blood work get worse. And so it, I agree with you completely. I just want to say with all due respect, um, correlation is not causation. And when you look at these kind of <laughs> studies, um, and it's with all due respect, I'm not advocating eating a ton of processed meat, but... Um, when you look at these studies and start to parse out some of the variables, usually people with these kind of lifestyles aren't active. And one of the things that Emily can attest to is when you're doing a fat adapted diet with um, using the right tools and magnesium and everything else, elimination is not a problem. So I think, once again, this is where the exercise component on fat changes the picture. Um, because when you look at these studies with uh, red meat, processed meat, Generally, there's other uh, factors like smoking, sedentary lifestyle, sure. alcohol. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to say that it's not something we should be aware of, but at the same time, there's other factors involved. Okay, other side. <clears throat> I'm Adam Nally. I'm a family physician and, board, and a board-certified obesity medicine specialist in, in Phoenix, Arizona. I've got a patient practice of about 6,500 patients, and I've been doing this 
over about 10 years in low carb. Um, just a simple comment, the nitrite comment, I think we need to put that to rest because yeah. there's twice as many nitrites in spinach and broccoli as there are in bacon. So we just need to make sure we're, we're aware of that. Um, but my big question for you is, uh, in, in, in my practice, uh, about 85% of the people in my population are either insulin resistant or pre-diabetic or even diabetic type 2. Um, and the question I have is for Pete, do you see a more rapid fat ad adaptation in the athletes that are exercising? Uh, and I, I qu quantify that with my average patient takes about six to eight weeks to fat adapt. And does exercise seem to speed that process up? Well, one of the, the big things people need to understand is when they get into fat adaptation, we actually coach, coach, we work with athletes, so we actually have to really tell them you don't want to reset and try to exercise at the same volume at the same time. So for that first, depending on the athlete, it can be two to three days to two to three weeks. You want to really decrease your um, volume of exercise. In fact, some people are, are so glucose dependent in athletes that laying on the couch and picking up the remote to change channels is an effort. Whereas some guys might be able to train through at a lower rate and just, they'll just notice they'll be off for two or three days. So um, it's like I say, a two to three day process to get that initial physiological shift for an athlete. And then uh, Steve and I have mused over this. It's usually about a six to eight week process for, of transition where you get the upregulation of the hormones and enzymes to burn fat at the rates we're seeing. And then beyond that, it's habit change and getting into that zone. So usually that's a six to 18 month uh, process to where people don't consciously think about it and just get in that zone where they can just perform flawlessly um, on that high fat. So that's kind of the, the picture we're seeing. Lots of physicians asking questions. We want everybody to get involved. Here's another physician. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for, for everyone on the panel, um, I have found that um, it's really hard to get people to be on any less than 20 grams of carb per day, and that usually that means essentially you have to limit vegetables, uh, let alone no fruit uh, and no you know, cookies, cakes, candies, no. Uh, so I, I wonder if everyone can tell me what exactly they're talking about get and keep people fat adapted, ketogenic in terms of grams of carbohydrates and whether that means you have to limit vegetables and whether you could have any fruit. I think it really depends on the person. Um, I have just seen, once I was able to get a ketonics, I was able to just experiment on everybody I knew and really um, it's amazing the variability for people and the tolerance for sugar for different people and carbohydrates for different people. Do you, do you have to limit any vegetables and do you have to, and can you eat any? I have no fruit because I'm at a point where, you know, I'm going to, I have giant terminal brain cancer. So I'm being really careful right now. But with the people I'm coaching, a lot of them aren't in my situation. So maybe they're doing it for weight loss or... Um, Hashimoto's or you know some other type of condition um, and their tolerance is very widely and being able to test every single person I think is the most helpful way to figure out because then they you can feel when your body feels the best and then you blow in and you realize like okay when I feel really good I'm blowing at this number because you really can feel ketosis as most of you guys know like you can feel when it's higher and you can feel when it's lower. For me personally, I try to get nine cups of vegetables in because I'm trying to get all the anthocyanins, antioxidants. So I, in my case, those are help fighting my cancer and fighting all my other health conditions. So I think it's very important that I, I try to get nine cups of vegetables a day and I can stay in super high levels of ketosis. I mean, I'm very high and I'm not... I'm going out there, it says that if I have a cup of tomato sauce, it should take me out of ketosis on paper, but it doesn't for me. So you really, I think you want to get down to basics, get rid of the carbs and the fruit in your life, see what your levels are, and then slowly start to add some things in and see where your personal levels of ketosis are and what your reactions are to different foods. 
And aside from potatoes and corn, you don't, aside from potatoes and corn, you don't limit any other vegetables? I, I limit all like supposedly sugary vegetables, but if I count up like tomatoes, peppers, shallots, garlic, um, I often can be, you know, at higher levels of carbs, but I have different reactions to different vegetables. Um, some people, garlic and onions are enough to throw you right out of ketosis. For me, it does not. So it really is personal to figure out what that is for each person. But you've got to keep the nutrition up. You know, we don't want to just like fake ketosis. You know, if you're not getting it through real food, um, I believe that you're not getting the benefits of real ketosis because we want to get all those great things that our ancestors ate in our diets because that's going to make us healthy along with the high levels of ketones. Uh, hi, this is actually for uh, Peter Defty. I, I should actually mention that I believe you may very likely be the most consequential person in this room because <laughs> because seriously, while, while we all want landmark studies, we could have 10 landmark studies, absolutely, absolutely fantastic ones, and they will not change minds like one person winning the New York City Marathon that's totally keto adapted. Yeah. We need to have those studies to back that up, but it's usually these anecdotes that really change minds. And let's face it, we wouldn't have had the rise of Ansel Keys if it wasn't for Eisenhower having the heart attack. And that's what got us in this mess in the first place. Right. Anyway, on to my question. Uh, do you actually have a list somewhere that we can point people to? Because it does come up all the time when we're telling other people about this diet. And this was like the most, this was the most information that I had seen for a while on, um, on lots of different athletes. And if there was just like a site somewhere where we could just point people to it to say, here's the athletic evidence of people who are actually winning who are fully ketogenic. Um, Thanks very much for that, but uh, I'm going to say that, that while that might be true, my experience is as long as there's not science to back it up, um, the, the naysayers who are very loud, no matter who wins what, uh, they're, they're just saying it's anecdotal. So it's really a combination of both people like me working in the real world to make it happen um, and looking at it from a holistic, uncontrolled sort of way, and then people doing well-designed, controlled studies to understand why this makes sense. Um, and what was your question again? Oh, Sorry. Oh. Sorry for posterity. I wanted to be sure it was on the yeah. mic. But yes, is there a, a list, um, particularly a website, that actually details all of the athletic... There's actually a... Um, uh, my site, I'm, uh, shameless self-promotion, there's the Vespa Power site, but also I think Low Carb Down Under has a blog piece by David Gretsch where he blogs and, and has a bunch of links to a lot of different athletes who are performing well on, um, uh, you know, do, doing outsized things. Is that correct, Rod? Correct. Yeah. So Low Carb Down Under, there's a David, couple of David Gretsch posts on, on how to do this. So I think you're going to see more of this, but Unfortunately, I'm sort of a tech Luddite, so I'm not good at social media and internet. I'm, I'm trying to get that going, but I've been, I'm, I'm more like Steve. Steve is in the studies, and Jeff are in the studies and the science. I'm focused on just working with athletes. It's what I love to do and That's make it happen. Steve getting us winners. Okay. <laughs> well, like I said, we've got a lot of interesting things, and like I said, there's some pretty interesting things going on out there. Okay, sorry, one more doctor. Uh, <laughs> and I guess uh, my, my uh, point is more of a, a comment, I guess. As, as a family practitioner struggling in, in the trenches, um, I'm dealing with everyday people and they're not ultra athletes and they just want to be healthy and lose weight. And I'm struggling with the whole practicality of this thing. And I really like this whole meat controversy because it is something I talk to my patients about. I say, okay, meat is not perfect. Um, there are better forms of meat, such as grass-fed beef. It's more expensive, and that may not be doable for a lot of patients, but I think it's the lesser of evils. I, I, okay, we'll take our chances with some meat, but I want you to get off carbs because I think that's the most important thing. So, I, you know, it's, it's something I think as doctors we all have to struggle with. Um, you know, you can't have perfection be the enemy of good. I think that's kind of what it comes down to, but where do we fall on that spectrum, and how do you deal with patients? But uh, it's interesting. Patients want to hear this. They're, they're listening. 
Um, although I'm competing against uh, advertising and friends and ethnic uh, diets and everything, but it's, uh, it's really uh, revitalized my practice. I just love dealing with this, so thank you. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lots of hands, good. Uh, hi, this is another question for Peter. Uh, so I'm Ivor Cummins, a uh, non-physician. I know, I know of you. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, fantastic talk there. But I think I picked up on um, APOB count. Did you have observations that it was high in no, vert? No, I, oh. no, we have not. I've not looked at that. Oh, okay. I thought you had high and variable for some of the cholesterol uh, or lipoprotein. Yeah, well, yeah, in terms of... I'm just looking at the overall picture, not, okay. not getting too specific with that. Okay, very yeah. good. I was just curious. You can also make comments. I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is also for Mr. Defty. I had a question when you were talking about... Do, or, okay. Um, <laughs> when you are talking about working with the Olympic swimmer yep. in cycling, or I guess strategically using carbohydrates... Um, I wanted to know, because I work a lot with athletes, and I come across this issue of bringing back in carbohydrates, and I know that the amount of carbohydrate and absolutely the type of carbohydrate impacts whether they continue using fat or carbohydrate in more amounts and during their activity. So I'm wondering if you could share like, how you went about... Oh, this is going to be awkward <laughs> for this crowd. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so this, this really is about allowing us to reach out and get these fat-adapted performance um, things so that people pay attention. And with people like uh, Romain Bardet and the uh, Olympic gold medal swimmer we're working with, um, what we do early season is get them well fat-adapted and get them really resilient. And it's not just the fat adaptation, it's also that nutrition, not calories, getting the right nutrient balance. We put them on a, what I call a, a whole animal eating program where they're doing liver and broth and, and all the uh, essential things so they get the right balance of nutrition. And they are doing vegetables and get them very well fat adapted. And um, then uh, what we do is we work with them as they go along. But when they get in their high volumes of training, I just kind of have to look the other way and then cycle in those, those little brief periods where we can kind of reset them. And, and as I said earlier, uh, the human body is really resilient. So if you're at that level, um, you can withstand some of that as long as you're cycling it back out. Like in the case of the Olympic swimmer, she was starting to see some of the stomach and gut issues of, of just putting through so many concentrated carbohydrates through her system. And, and now she's able to tolerate them because she's, she's taking in less. You know, it's all incremental stuff at this level. So she's taking in maybe 20 to 30% less carbohydrate and performing better. Um, but at that point, you know, they're, they're going to use a lot of carbohydrates. Same with Romain. Um, when he's in the Tour de France, we, we can't, we have to, you know, put the carbohydrates so he has that quick energy. But the whole idea is the reason those carbohydrates work better using less is because these athletes are fat adapted and uh, compared to their other athletes. Yeah, I'm just a weekend warrior. So um, what I'm wondering about, though, I, have, I do hut trips here in Colorado, and I ski into the huts. We ski in at temperatures you know, between 0 and 10 degrees, and we're skiing for 7 or 8 hours to get to the hut. I need to be fat adapted, and I tend to be keto. I'm wondering, what do you think is the best options for me the day before and the evening after coming in? And like you were saying, you just had a Vespa, and you could run forever. Um, is that a good way for me to stay keto adapted while I do this kind of exercise? Well, from what we're seeing, if you get that initial, you know, if you get yourself well adapted, um, like I said, that window of carbohydrate tolerance opens up. So if you're going out for seven or eight hours the next day, we do typically what we do is what we call a carb sneak, where you'll have uh, a fatty uh, source of, of protein and fat, like you know salmon with butter on it, or a, a USDA prime ribeye, which is more than half of that's calories or fat. And then you might have a loaded baked potato or sweet potato. And when I say loaded, you're going to sneak the carbs in under a blanket of fat, so you load it up with butter, salt, and sour cream, 
and then maybe have a either a fatty coffee or what we like to do if you don't want the caffeine is like a an herbal tea with a teaspoon of honey and heavy cream or MCT oil in the morning. And um, I've done 13-hour, 35K run hikes in the high Sierra, you know, 13 hours before meals, only a total of 56 calories during the day, and it was just three Vespas. And and so um, that's – and then you just cycle the carbs in and out and maintain that sharp ketosis, and that's where we see that the benefits. And, and you know, for this crowd – I've got to convince you to bring the carbohydrates back in because like John Rutherford, the person in the faster study who who's literally burned the most fat that's ever been recorded, 1.8 grams a minute, he says that one of the hardest things for him to do once he got keto adapted was to bring the carbs back in for race performance. And, and he says, and but like what we're seeing at that elite level is when you're fat adapted and you bring the carbs in, you're using less and you get this huge bang. It's like rocket fuel. It's like crack. That's why I'm saying we, we're looking at like a performance-enhancing drug. And you use less. And when you're robust like that, you can get away with it. If you're metabolically broke, that window of tolerance is much less. Okay. I do a lot of hot trips. I just wanted to throw in that I have three secret weapons for my hot trips. One is uh, a container of heavy cream, um, which I'm drinking right now. I haven't eaten yet today because I'm just running on heavy cream. And then I bring a container of butter, and then I make a container of homemade mayonnaise. And if I have those three things, no matter what I'm presented with, if I add those, then my fat levels go up high enough that I'm not hungry. And I also, if I have to have something that's not ideal, as long as, like you're saying, you've you're got that blanket of fat, and you're adding in slightly of something else. Only time for one more question, sorry. Um, I'm not a doctor, and I don't get all of this when they talk about um, grass-fed beef. Grain makes you fat, grain makes cows fat. We're supposed to be high fat. Why is a high fat cow that I'm eating going to affect me because it's got, because you fed it grain? Well, I'm a beef farmer. Do you want to have me take that one? <laughs> so, you know, I, I think a lot of people who are farmers, I don't know, do we have any farmers in this room? Yeah, so I raised cows, and when cows eat grain, whether it's GMO corn or organic corn or whatever corn it is, they go into a state called acidosis, which we're all semi-familiar with. So the cow's stomach, if you feed cow uh, grain for longer than four months, it will actually keel, keel over and die. Wow. Excuse me. Uh, in all deference, no. So let's just stop there. Well, <laughs> let's talk about the positives of the grass-fed meat, though, because you can see higher levels of conjugated linoleic acid, and you can see all kinds of antioxidants go up. The quality... I see it in people's blood work every day. We had a woman in the clinic who was buying grass-fed meat from a farmer, and her VEGF levels, her inflammation levels were really, really high, and we couldn't figure it out. Turns out that farmer had bought his meat at Costco and was faking it at the farmer's market. And so the minute she got off that meat, her blood levels returned to normal. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, we could go on all day with this, but anyway, I hope everybody enjoyed the session. We are going to reconvene at 3 p.m. Rangan, uh, he talked about, uh, you know, all the uh, slow carbs and, uh, and, and being ketotic, and that's pretty much my diet. Um, I eat tons of those things, and I intermittent fast 22 hours a day, and typically at the end of my fast, I'm at 1.7 millimolar ketones. So uh, it certainly is possible. And my, when, when I run it through a, uh, a calculator, I probably have um, maybe 80, 90 grams a day of carbs, of which greater than 50 are, are, uh, are fiber. So, uh, you know, and, and from my perspective, the idea of why you would want to uh, check for ketones is that ketones are, is, is a simple way to check for the absence or, or, or a low level of insulin. So yeah. it's just my thought. Well, thanks for that. I really appreciate that. I mean, uh, the reason I brought it up is because 
I just I see loads of blog articles and I see lots of fights on the internet about this whole, you know, nourishing the microbiome whilst eating low carb. But I think you can do both. And um, I was really, yeah, thank you for your comments there. Thank you. One more thing real quick. Um, a, a friend who is di type 1 diabetic calls herself a termite because all of those fibers spike her blood sugar. Right. And so it's not necessarily true, again, for everybody. I agree with that. With all dietary plans, I think we all respond um, to different dietary plans. I think... You know, as I said in my, in my talk, if there's a few conditions for me, uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, fatty liver, it's a no-brainer. You have to surely start with a low-carb diet. How much you can then tolerate, it depends. And um, yeah, I, I'm all for N equals 1 experiments with people once you give them the right tools to start, and then uh, you can modify it. Two questions back here. Um. I hope this is not too much of a tangent, but I was wondering if anybody had any experience with uh, the relationship between nutritional ketosis and breathalyzers and roadside sobriety tests. I'm asking for a friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, just anecdotally, I've, I've heard uh, you know, it's a good excuse, isn't it? Uh, oh, officer, oh, I have too many uh, broccoli. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, anecdotally, I've heard that they, that uh, can cause a uh, an abnormal breath test. Uh, Jimmy's nodding here. He looks like he's. 2.0 on the blood ketones, and it makes sugar drunk. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is an issue. I don't, I don't know what uh, how to get around that, but uh, it is an issue. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, I would uh, generally, as a, this group, I think that we have so much in common that I don't want to pick uh, nitpicking discussions, but Dr. Fung, I, I want to compliment you on a, uh, a very engaging presentation, Thank but you. I will disagree with you on a number of your interpretations of the published literature, um, particularly around nitrogen conservation in periods of fasting lasting longer than 24 hours. Uh, there's quite a bit of the literature that I'd suggest that we both should read and, and discuss, including Aromalis's classic paper from JCI from 1978 from the University of Toronto on how much nitrogen it takes to counter negative nitrogen balance, that is protein loss, during a, a severe caloric restriction. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I want to take particular uh, issue with your quote of the Cahill data and uh, your interpretation that there was neg excuse me, negligible nitrogen loss uh, the data you picked was from 28 days of total fasting. The total nitrogen excretion was four grams, which represents a quarter pound of lean body mass loss. And up until that time, the subjects had lost uh, 20 pounds, half of which came from lean body mass. So there is, I don't think you can safely say that nitrogen losses are negligible during fasting. Yeah, I think that there actually is quite a debate about this, uh, truthfully. And, um, you know, I take your point that there is a lot of people on both sides of the fence that, yes, is there protein loss? No, is there pr not protein loss? And it's very hard to tease out uh, exactly what it is that is being lost here because clearly there is a baseline uh, protein turnover, right? Um, I'm not saying that there isn't. We do need some protein. You cannot fast forever, right? There's essential amino acids and so on. But all I'm saying is that the body doesn't ramp up protein, which is the whole point that a lot of people try to make, right? So um, does the body start burning protein t for gluconeogenesis, for instance? Now, there is protein loss, right? Because you start with amino acid uh, as your substrate for uh, gluconeogenesis, right? Even glycerol doesn't actually fulfill the entire amount. But that's presuming that all of this excess protein is um, bad, right? All this excess protein loss because you've got all these things, The you know, people talk about autophagy and so on. And a lot of people are talking about, well, maybe a lot of these go into that pathway of amino acids that are getting, they're getting rid of these amino acids, they're getting rid of these damaged proteins. And there's people who talk about that. I take your point that there's, there probably is, you could probably find equal amounts on both sides. 
Uh, 28 days, of course, is far in excess of what I generally use. I mean, there's alternate daily fasting. There's all types of different fasting. I'd like to, at some point, dive into the data, and maybe the organizers next time we can have a debate. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> suggestion. OK, have a question over here. Hi, I had a question about the fasting as well. Um, I, I've, having watched some of your literature online, I've, uh, you've spoken a little bit about how the fasting has created a benefit, uh, it, and I might not be saying this correctly, but a benefit to um, insulin resistance. Um, and I can see that, of course, you know, during the fast. But I was interested if you could speak to, um, like, what are the results as far as going, like, wh what what are you seeing after that? Are you seeing patients, um, hypoth you know, who are continuing on a low carbohydrate diet, having significantly like better um, better blood glucose numbers and better markers of less insulin resistance, I guess. Or what are you seeing in later on? Because it's it's unclear to me. Um, I can imagine the benefit of the weight loss during a fast, but I, I'm unclear as to what the long term benefit is later on. Yeah, it's something that you really have to um, follow people on, right? It's not like you can do a two-day fast and that'll take care of the last 30 years of, like, sugar and uh, bread, right? It's something that you have to catch up on, and it's a time-dependent process, right? The insulin resistance is a time-dependent process. So, I mean, I've probably supervised close to a 1,000 people on various fasting regimens. We work on, with them individually on what they like to tolerate and what they don't like to tolerate. But most of them do have to continue for some time because you got to realize that by the time you get to see me, it's usually about 20, 25 years of this kind of excessive insulin state. And it's not going to go away in a month, right? Even if you do a lot of fasting, it's not going to go away. It takes time, right? It can go away, but it takes time and it takes a lot of uh, work at it. So you do see the benefits, but... You know, it, what I'm saying is you can't just do one fast or two fast and three fast and say, oh, look, you know, there's nothing, right? Uh, I went back to eating uh, white bread and look, my sugar is high, right? That did nothing. That's, the, that's not the point, right? The point is that if you kind of continue to apply these things, then you will see benefits, right? And that's the thing. If you don't eat, your sugars will go down. Now, I take the point that it's not for everybody. I'm just saying it's an option for people, right? Does everybody have to? No, not at all. And if you find that you're losing tons of muscle, then don't do it. If you're an, an ultra-endurance athlete and you worry about it, then don't do it, right? But it's an option for people. It's an option for people to use when they need to, when they don't need to. But you can't expect that it's going to you know, do everything. It's like... Uh, you, you can't undo those years and years of problems in such a short time. It takes time, and you have to follow them, and you have to make sure they follow through with it, and that's, that's what we do for people. Thanks, everybody. You all had such a fantastic lectures. It was a very enjoyable afternoon. I have two questions for Jason. One is really quick. Do you use appetite suppressants? Do you um, think it's a not, good idea? I, I think that there are some natural appetite suppressants. So some people find coffee as a natural appetite. I mean, you, you guess what? Depends what you say natural. But coffee and green tea have often been considered appetite suppressants. Some people consider things like cinnamon. So I don't use, like, drugs, right? Exactly. I don't use any of those. But I allow green tea and coffee and all that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things, one of the other uh, big advantages of using things like that is that there's a huge placebo effect, right? So you could give a placebo and get like 50% response, so why not, right? So if you say, oh yeah, you should drink green tea because it's going to suppress your appetite, guess what? It will, right? Or you say, <laughs> <laughs> you should drink water because it will suppress your appetite. It will. And I don't see anything wrong with that, right? The thing about the placebo effect is that the effect is actually quite real. So I don't see why we wouldn't use it to our benefit, right? So yes, I think that there probably is a small effect of these things, coffee. And interestingly enough, people also describe it with decaf coffee. So it's not necessarily the caffeine. Maybe it's all those various antioxidants and so on. But Green tea, you know, they talk about these cachexins and stuff. So there may be something there. I don't 
care particularly. I just tell people, <laughs> yeah, it'll suppress it your works. appetite. The more enthusiastic you are, the better effect you get. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And then a longer question, or harder maybe, is um, how do you evaluate if somebody is losing too much protein, you know, as they're going through and you say, how do you decide, oh, it's time to stop this particular fast or have more protein or anything like that? Uh, that's a difficult question because measuring it is actually very difficult, right? So you can do various DEXA scans, but from a clinical standpoint, I don't do that. For the most part, most of the patients I treat are not that worried about, you know, lifting 500 pounds, right? Deadlifting and stuff. Most of the patients are worried about their type 2 diabetes. So I take it that if, if, if muscle strength is your major concern, then maybe you shouldn't be fasting, right? But if you're worried about having type 2 diabetes, then maybe it's worth it, right? And I, I don't think that there is a um, magic number, a magic pill. You know, to me, I say if you're, lo if you're worried about losing a lot of muscle, then you should probably do some exercise, right? Because we all know that if you lift weights, you will build muscle, right? Now you do need to eat protein for that, right? Because you can't build muscle out of like nothing. You do need to eat protein for that for sure. But if it's your diabetes, if it's your weight, then it's an option for people, right? Um, and I think that that's really my major point with the protein, yes. Uh, perhaps you do lose some muscle. You do you lose some muscle with most diets, right? Most people who lose weight, if you measure them, they will lose muscle. So you saw the biggest loser slide, right? So you saw the muscle mass and the fat mass. You saw most of it. Now they're exercising like crazy, right? That's how they maintained a lot of muscle, but they still lost muscle, right? This is not fasting. They lost muscle and they're exercising friggin' like five hours a day, right? And Jillian Michaels is screaming, you know, in their ear. You still lost muscle, right? So I'm not saying that you're not going to lose muscle ever, right? You may lose muscle, but you will with other diets too. My real concern actually is about, and I didn't clarify this, um, about the brain uh, protein, because we can actually tell people to do some mild exercise, and we know, I think, from other studies that it helps to preserve muscle mass during any kind of weight loss, so I imagine it's the same in fasting, but but it's protein's gonna come from somewhere, and so if you are preserving it in your muscle, and if your brain is 50% protein, which I like to think mine is, um, then, where that there's we we have no way of measuring what's going on in there, and that's where I I'm just like there's be, would be nice to have some kind of a way to evaluate that. And this is the thing, right? If this if I just made up fasting like yesterday, yeah, I'd say yeah, you should be concerned, right? But we've only been doing it since like the dawn of time, right? And much of it was inadvertent, right? But Again, if you think that you're going to lose a lot of muscle, like let's forget about a little bit of muscle here and there, right? Let's say you're going to lose a lot of muscle when you fast and gain it all back as fat. Well, what would happen, right? You'd see all those traditional societies, those, you know, uh, aboriginals and stuff, and they'd be nothing but fat, right? Because they had a lot of feast famine cycles. Right? So uh, again, leaving aside some of the nitpicky stuff about whether you actually lose muscle or not, let's just say that a huge amount of skeletal muscle loss is not really within my realm of concern, only because it's withstood the test of time, right? I mean, are you saying that now that we eat like all this food, we're so much more muscular than we were in 1950? I doubt it very much, right? I wouldn't be too worried about it. Again, it depends on where your concerns lie, right? If your concerns is about type 2 diabetes, then this is an effective treatment, okay? And same as the diet. If you're worried about muscle loss, then yeah, and, and that's your primary concern, I, I take that, then don't do it, right? It's not that you have to do it. But again, be clear on what your goal is, like what you're trying to get out of this diet, and be clear on what it is that you're willing to do for it, right? So if you're worried about muscle loss, yeah, exercise more. Maybe fasting is not for you. I'd but add that, w so one part of the literature we didn't really talk about is the work of Bruce Bistrian around protein sparing modified fasts. And so uh, we, we talked about intermittent fasting and fat fasting, but so in the, 
70s and early 80s, Bistrian and colleagues did a series of trials where they were um, admitting participants to the hospital ward and monitoring them and monitoring their meals. And But the, the diet that they were prescribing basically was a fast, but with enough supplementation of protein that they were retaining lean body mass. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank the panel and as well as the, all the other presenters um, today. It was a truly a very fascinating um, discussion and presentations. Thank you. Um, my background is in law, so my concern is more of a kind of a public policy type of approach to promoting low carb and, you know, paleo and these type of uh, diets. So what I've noticed, and I'm sure everybody else has too, that in the last year or two, there's been some sort of like, a, you know, the, either the pharmaceutical industry or the food industry coming out and publishing bogus studies to defend their profits. So recently there was like the nine mice uh, study. And then just a couple of months ago, I think Coca-Cola gave University of Colorado $300,000 to put together a bogus dietary conference and said that promoted shorter lifespans, one of the speakers actually, you know, went ahead and said shorter lifespans was like good for the national budget or something like that. <laughs> so I, I wanted to know yeah, yeah, exactly. that, <laughs> it, 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 look them up, <laughs> that I, I would like to know um, whether, is there some sort of response to this in terms of like, can we form a nonprofit to swiftly address these issues that come out? you know, in terms of bad studies, in terms of like, uh, you know, calling out these companies and these industries for promoting bad science, um, you know, things like that. Is there any sort of effort and what can we do as kind of like, you know, spectators and weekend warriors about this? Thank you. I would mention or direct people toward one, which is the formation of the Nutrition Coalition over the last year. Uh, Dr. Sarah Hallberg is the interim uh, director of that, um, and Nina Teicholz has been has been very involved as well. So that is an effort um, to bring more um, scientific information um, to light as it relates to dietary guidelines. And if you go to their website, I believe they have a press release that talks about the um, 2000 and um, prior to the uh, 2015 dietary guidelines being released, um, Congress passed in the last budget resolution um, a uh, statement that um, the, it, directing the National Institutes of Medicine um, to do a full uh, sort of survey or digging deeper into how the dietary guidelines are created. Um, and so maybe one of the other panelists knows more about that, but I think that's worth people being familiar with. Um, certainly in the United Kingdom, um, me and some of the other doctors, we're trying to form a sort of collaboration together. Yeah, someone called Sam Feltham has put together a, something called Public Health Collaboration. And so there's a few doctors, some of us in the media, which also helps to get the message out myself, Asim Malhotra and, and 10 others have got together to try and challenge some of the existing uh, dietary guidance. Um, again, you know, obviously what's going on in the States, what's going on in the UK. Uh, hopefully the more awareness that this brings, there'll be a sort of public demand. Um, and the, the other point I think is, is important is, I think we run into problems when we try and give one set of dietary guidelines for everybody. And it's easy then to criticize those guidelines and say, well, you know, that's not right for this, that's not right for this. Let's, let's be honest, type 2 diabetes is, and pre-diabetes and insulin resistance is a major public health issue. It's uh, it's a financial issue. It will bankrupt healthcare systems. And the solution is relatively simple, actually, which is what's so baffling, I think, to uh, so many of us here. And so I think if we can be quite specific with this kind of dietary intervention for this kind of problem, I think maybe we can uh, bat off uh, some of the criticism. Um, anyway, these are just some of, some of my thoughts. Okay. Yeah, I guess I spoke about the sort of project that we're trying uh, in Australia. Um, I think um, I think we're a bit uh, all old-fashioned and so on, and uh, 
I think we need to realize that if you want to run a campaign these days, you run a social media campaign and you run a celebrity-based campaign or an athlete-based campaign. Now, we may not like that, but the reality is um, they recently published the list of the, of the people who have the highest Twitter following in health and nutrition in my country, and not one of them was a doctor. Um, in fact, I, I think that I was the highest That could be a good one. thing. That could yeah. be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, back in the day, people got their, their health advice from doctors. Nowadays, they get them from the, from the internet, they get them from celebrities, they get from, uh, from uh, social media blogs, and it's usually a, uh, a fitness person. They often have very good ideas. I mean, you know, look, at the, Jimmy does a fantastic job on, on social media, and, and a number of people in, the, in this room do. So I think, you know, you've got to be smart you know, we've got to get celebrities on board. We've got to get high-profile athletes on board. We've got to do a social media campaign. I mean, that, that's, that's how people change their opinion these days. It's no use writing articles in news. No one reads newspapers. You know, nobody reads sort of serious newspapers anymore. Not the sort of people we're trying to get to. And I think the only way that governments are going to respond and act is people pressure. And uh, because, you know, they're not going to get... We're up against some very big enemies. You know, we're up against the medical profession, the dietitians, the food industry, agriculture, and most of the politicians. You know, that's a pretty formidable uh, set of opponents. And uh, we've got to be smart and get around it. You know, I mean, they've got to be Obama-like campaigns. You know, social media-based and uh, celebrity-based, really clever stuff. And that's the way we're going to get our message across. Okay, three quick questions, and we're going to call it a day. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you, gentlemen. My, I'm Adam Nelly from Arizona. Um, the uh, two-part two question. Um, in my office, we, we use low-carbohydrate, very ketogenic diets, and I see regression of the diseases of civilization within 18 to 24 months, insulin resistance and diabetes. What I wanted to know is, do you have any data that shows adding intermittent fasting speeds that process, number one? And number two, we also are doing carotid intimal studies looking at uh, atherosclerotic uh, plaques and the formation, and I'm actually seeing it regress with ketogenic diets in my office. Um, do you see that with intermittent fasting, does it speed the process? I don't actually have, there really is very little data on fasting in general, right? So that data really just doesn't exist. So I can only tell you kind of anecdotally for whatever it's worth, right? The, the goal of intermittent fasting and also of low carbohydrate diets in my mind is really to try and reduce insulin um, because a lot of these diseases I think are diseases of hyperinsulinemia. So the whole point is to lower insulin. So yes, from a purely practical standpoint, I actually started with low carbohydrate diets, but I didn't find them kind of effective enough for many patients. So the addition of intermittent fasting or even extended fasting really helped boost that. So the surprise was that many people found it much easier actually. And that was something that really, you know, you can't kind of quantify so much. Uh, people find intermittent kind of uh, regimens a little easier to take. And if they find it easier to follow, then great, right? That's whatever works for you. So I have no problem with low-carbohydrate diets. I think people do very, very well. Um, but again, it, uh, it offers an option. So if you look at just studies of, say, insulin, then yeah, fasting does a better job lowering insulin than low-carbohydrate diets. You can say that, but whether or not it does a better job for uh, type 2 diabetes, for weight gain, all that sort of thing. Um, I think so, but I couldn't, I couldn't uh, make that with any kind of data behind it. Last question. You mentioned that a social movement would be a great way to go. Do you know if any of the presidential candidates eat a low-carb diet? <laughs> Well, interestingly, uh, I believe that Bill Clinton uh, has been on a low-carb diet. I'm not sure about uh, Hillary or whether Hillary and Bill have anything to do with each other, but uh, um, <laughs> other, other than, uh, than in public. But um, um, he's certainly, you know, uh, well, well known to uh, have been on a low-carb diet. So uh, I'm not sure what, uh, what Hillary's... Uh, is Hillary still a candidate? Yeah, yeah, I think she is, yeah. Okay. Thank you, panel.